Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for the third and final part of this three-part series on API design with Bruce Tate. Uh, just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you for, for tuning in over the last three weeks and uh, a, a special thank you to Bruce who has been such a fantastic host and I can't wait to see what is in store for the, for the last piece of this webinar series. Um, just off the top, a few reminders of stuff we've discussed in weeks gone by. Uh, so, as you will know by now, Bruce and Groxio offer short courses. Uh, the one of May runs on May 27, and there is one more space that is OTP focused. I'm sure Bruce will talk more about that. There is the subscription model uh, programmer passport. At the moment, we're focusing on OTP, and then as of mid July, it will switch to Phoenix Live View. So, uh, if you're interested in either of those topics, which I know a lot of our audience are, uh, it's a great time to get involved. And then Gig City Elixir, the conference that, that Bruce runs and organizes, has an announcement on Friday um, that he'll also talk to you more about. As always, we will run question and answer at the end of the session, but we will be taking questions right throughout. So if you have a question for us, uh, hit us up on Twitter or at the questions box inside the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Bruce. Bruce, take it away. Hey everybody, it's Bruce from Groxio Learning and it's so gratifying to be here with you. So I, I get a little bit um, cooped up and I guess as a lot of us do during this, during this pandemic and being able to connect with not just my little corner of the world, but the whole world is just a whole lot of fun for me. I hope it is for you too. So this series is on API design. It's actually part three of a series that we've been working on together. If you want to hear more about these ideas and about programming in general, I've got a couple of different avenues for you. The first is we can have a conversation at, um, I'm at Red Rapids, and the second is that there are some things that Groxio Learning is doing on an ongoing basis to, to help shape the way that you think about not just Elixir um, or Erlang or other Beam languages, but languages beyond that. And I want to talk about a few of those now. So first we have an OTP focused course. So one of the things that we've done for this pandemic is to introduce some um, very small classes for a um, for about half of our normal training rates. And um, this one is about OTP. And the cool thing about these classes is that we focus them to, to a very small group that allows us to share the keyboard and actually do mostly mob programming. So you get to learn by doing and they're, they're a tremendous amount of fun. We've had, um, I've had some friends come by that, that have uh, just wanted to brush up on things like, like LiveView. And, um, and I've also been able to weave in a few of the people that I mentor along the way. So they've been a whole lot of fun. I hope you get to join us for one of them. Um, we're running these through July and then we'll kind of see where the world's at and if, if this service is still needed. So the second thing is, is watch the Gig City Elixir account. We're going to announce where we're going with our conference. It's definitely gonna happen, but we're going to announce whether we are online or in skin space <laughs> in, um, in person on, um, in, um, in late October. And then the third thing is that we are running a subscription model at Groxio Learning. And we basically handle uh, programming languages and big ideas. And the big idea that we're working on right now is OTP. And this is part of our Joe Armstrong celebration so that we could be thinking about Joe um, on the anniversary of his passing. And since there's been such a huge response, we're going to actually carry the OTP, um, the, the Joe Armstrong inspired inventions. We're gonna stay on the beam for one more session, and we're actually going to talk about Phoenix Live View, which if, if you guys have been following, we, we've actually seen uh, Phoenix go to version 1.5 with Live View and all the scaffolds included, and it's almost a magical programming model. So I hope you'll, you'll be able to join us for one of these things. I sure do like hearing from you. So in part one of this series,
we talked about the concept of designing systems in layers. And this was basically uh, carried forward the ideas of the book, Designing Elixir Systems with OTP. That's a book that I wrote with James Gray. And he was definitely the lead on that project and, and had um, it had the big ideas, the ideas that if you design things in the shapes that Elixir that Elixir expects and that are in 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 symbiosis with Elixir, then good things happen. Then the language will reward you. Like for example, if you build your modules where um, in the correct way with reducers, then things just happen a lot more simply and, and Elixir rewards you along the way. And we looked at a few examples of that in, in frameworks like Plug. And we also looked at the concept of a trap door. And that's the idea that if you're building an API around an abstraction, sometimes it's useful to allow access to the abstraction right below. And that that's called a trap door. And that idea came from a guy named Glenn Vanderberg, who was tremendously influential in my career. And so in the second part, even though we're working with a functional language, we talked about the idea of thinking in terms of data first. So if you think about the data that flows through the functions, maybe alongside, maybe even before you actually talk about and think about the functions that form your API, sometimes you're better off. And today I'd like to talk about one core concept. So once you have your API in place, and once you're almost ready to release it, the thing that you can do that provides the most benefit is to simplify it. And we're going to talk about this concept of simplification. And I want you to, for each subtopic, I want you to think about the idea that we're simplifying the API, that we're, that we're making things smooth, that we're reducing the surface area. So the first thing that we'll talk about is trimming, which means that you reduce the overall surface area of the API that you're building. And the second thing is that you can often improve the usability of an API by deciding what's what's required and by providing meaningful defaults for the rest. And then you can expand that idea by act, actually doing something called inversion of control and providing default code implementations for your APIs. And in Elixir, this is called a behavior. And in other languages, they have other names like abstract interfaces and things like that. But the idea of inversion of control is tremendously important. It has been in JavaScript and in, in Elixir and Erlang and Haskell and, and pretty much um, many of the languages that are dear to us. And the last concept that we'll talk about is protecting your API from future change. And so if you think about all of these things before you actually press the button and release the API, you're much better off. So I wanna start with the idea of trimming an API. So consider an API and I don't really care exactly what the modules or functions are, but you have one or more buckets of functions and Elixir, those are modules and in your language, it might be something else. And then you have functions that make this up, or it might be procedures in an object-oriented language. But if you can think about this thing as a three-dimensional shape, so maybe we're seeing one side of a cube here, then the surface area becomes the amount of area on the outside of this cube, right? Where each one of the edges is one of the one of the faces corresponding to one of these functions. And if you think about an API as the overall surface area, then you can start to think about how to improve it. So one of the things that, that you can explore is this idea of deciding which functions are public and private. So at this point, I want to break away and write just a tiny amount of code. So let's do a mix new 
um, I don't know, maybe we build a, um, a teenager or how about a, the real hero, um, a mom, a coder, coder's mom. And um, so let's change that directory and pop in there. And um, let me let me drag this window to where we can all see it. And I'm gonna bump the font a little bit. But the main code is here. And this is Elixir and def basically means I'm defining a function. And you would not be able to access this function if you were in Erlang unless you exported it. And, and in fact, that terminology stays with us, right? So I could ask IEX. So I'm gonna bump this font a little bit just in case um, you can't see it well. Bear with me a second. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bump the font a bit more. Okay, so I'm going to ask for the exports for this module, which is A coder's mom, right? And you can see that there's one export, and I'm going to go ahead and add another function to this module. So maybe, um, maybe if you ask the coder mom something, uh, some type of, of a question. The coder's mom always responds, go ask your father. Okay, so now if I ask for the exports, then I get two functions. Now, you might ask yourself, why doesn't Elixir have have the export statement that would go on the top of an Erlang program? But it does. Basically, when you when you make a function private, you um, you take it off the export list, right? So you do two things. The first thing is we're no longer exporting this function called ask, and the second thing is that we are enabling some of the warnings so that Elixir can help us to build more tidy code. And these are these are both related to reducing the surface area. Of, of a public API. So let's take a look at the impact of this, right? So if I'm thinking about the total surface area of that thing, and if I think about controlling the exports, so think about changing a function from def to def p as removing a function from the surface area in the export list. Right, so now rather than having the surface area of a cube, I have this surface area of something that looks like a triangular prism, which is nice, right? Which dramatically reduces the amount of code that I have to document for public use and the amount of code that is resistant from change because my users are starting to depend on it. So this is a hugely important part of API design the idea that I take a pass through my API and then I decide which things are public and which things are private, AKA which things go on the export list and are publicly accessible and are not accessible, right? So the next thing that I wanna talk about is another thing that impacts the total surface area of an API. If we look at this, part of the area isn't just that the functions exist, but how many arguments that these functions have. And so if you think about ways to build our, um, our functions with, um, with more optional content, then I'm, off, then I'm a little bit better off. So I wanna take this opportunity to, um, to basically fill in a blind spot for some new Elixir developers that might be following along or some people who might not know Elixir. So one of the things that Elixir does is it allows 
us to make, uh, it, it has some shorthand notation that I want to explain here. So let's say that we are building a function and hello world is going to, so maybe I'm going to take a question, a question and options, right? And maybe one of the things that I, I say is um, I'm going to ask the question, how are you? Right? And I'm going to pass the options that look like this. Um, I could say, um, for example, um, a mood. Curious, like that, right? So I want to point out, I want to talk about exactly what's happening with these options. So one of the things that we can do is we can we can inspect the options as they come in. And that's going to help a little bit. So recompile. OK, so question is unused. Um, and we removed that underscore. So let's go ahead and add that back again. And we don't really care about the question at this point. But the options, so let's go ahead and say, um, how did I not save that? Yeah, look at that blue dot. I didn't save that. So I'm going to recompile. And I'm going to go ahead and ask the coder's mom. Dot. I'm going to, I'm going to say hello. And I'm going to ask a question. What's up? What's up, right? And, um, oh, actually, um, I don't have that. Yeah, so um, I don't have that additional argument, right? So um, hello doesn't take any argument. So this is going to ask, how are you? And it's going to pass a mood of curious. And you can see that this is a, that this is syntactic sugar for a list. But that's not everything that's going on here, right? So in, so before Elixir had maps, it had something called a keyword dictionary, where you would basically specify something as a list of tuples, right? So, so for example, this one would be a mood. And curious like that, right? And so watch what happens when I return this. So this will return the same value. Oh, <laughs> that's not what I wanted at all. I wanted a two tuple, right? So um, rather than um, than including, rather than spe specifying a full map which had um, which which has a different representation, you would include a list of of, um, of two tuples where this is the key and this is the value, right? And so maybe I had another, um, maybe I had a um, state a question, and that was how are you? Right, so watch what happens to this representation when I press enter. Okay, so what we're seeing is that there's another little bit of syntactic sugar that's happening. So if all of the all of the first arguments, if this is a list of two tuples and the first arguments are atoms, then you get the option of rather than listing the two tuples, you get the option of flipping the colon to the other side. So this is an atom with the colon on the other side, and you get to eliminate the mustaches, the curly braces on either end, and the commas, and um, and you get this, this beautiful syntax, right? So that's what's happening when you see this code right here, right? So the first bit of syntactic sugar is that since this is the last argument, I can remove the brackets, and I get the syntactic sugar as I would for any type of um, any type of um, of the the keyword keyword lists by specifying just the list of two tuples. So that's what's happening here. But anyway, the impact on my API is that I can take my functions. <laughs> 
and I can reduce like the bottom function there. I reduced all of the all of the individual arguments by collapsing them into arguments. And this has two benefits. The first benefit is that I do reduce this the surface area of things that someone has to know to use my API. And, and as a side conversation here, the sheer amount of things that you have to know to use an API or a language determines how quickly beginners can master your API or language. So when you reduce, when you take a pass through your APIs and decide exactly what's required and exactly um, what can be defaulted, you're making the API easier to learn for the expected case and for, um, and you should improve adoption as well. The second thing is that we have this, we have this uh, limitation where we cannot track more than two or three places worth of positional information, right? So the only thing that makes the argument A different from the argument B in this case is the position. And having to remember that the, that the B in the second position stands for something important is really difficult on a programmer. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a place where we could have significant errors and it's a place where we can we can actually slow every user of our API down. But by having options, we can allow the individual user to label the options that come in. So, and if we do that to one function, you can see that it's going to significantly re reduce my surface area, but we can do that for all the functions. And in fact, since those are options, we can specify those as, as um as optional so basically when you see the double backslashes what you should see in your head <laughs> so what happened is is as as we needed to add default arguments to a function we needed an operator and the equals operator was out because that was used uh, that was used to name arguments when we were doing pattern matches right so jose said well, the the double slash looks sort of like a sideways equals, and then eventually we flip that to a double backslash, so that the um, so that this this basically means um, that that the argument is is optional, and we wanted this um, or Jose wanted this to look like the optional arguments in languages like Ruby. So what happens is now we can change the sh we can reduce the surface area of the API still more. So even though there are two exports here, the user doesn't have to know them both. And the overall surface area for the learning purposes, if not for maintenance purposes, is significantly reduced and that will improve my adoption and as you can see later on, that's going to improve my ability to extend the API. Okay, so the third concept that I want to talk about is this idea of inversion of control. Now, if you if you come from, for example, JavaScript or Java, you say, hey, I know all about inversion of control because everything is a callback. But if you're not comfortable or familiar with this terminology, this is what I mean. So maybe I have some custom code, that's my programming, and I'm coding along, yada, yada. And then I call into an API. So that's the API interface. And I code along, yada, yada, and I drop into the API. I call into the API. And so the yellow code is the code that I have to write, and the red code is the code provided by the API. So this is one of the reasons that we use an API. But what can happen sometimes Sometimes we can invert control, and this is what we mean. So let's think about this custom code as something that I could call from an API layer. So the API creator, creator creates a default implementation, yada, yada, and then says, okay, I'm going to let them pass in some kind of module, and that's custom code, right? And maybe, there's not just one of these, these callbacks, maybe there's multiple callbacks. Well, I've already spoiled, giving away some of the ending, 
But in Elixir, this is a behavior with the proper British spelling. Actually, I guess it would be Swedish, right? And these bits of custom code are called callbacks. And for anyone who has used a gen server, I might ask you, how many callbacks does gen server support real quick? And you might not be able to tell me, but that's a good thing because some of those callbacks are defaulted. And so this reduces the surface area of the API that I'm using still more, which is a beautiful thing. So the last thing that I wanna talk about, and I wanna talk about this just briefly, is the idea that once you're finished with an API, it's, and once you release the first version, this is a really important point in history, because before that, you had some freedom that you had that, that you won't have um, from this day forward, because for APIs, success is equal to compatibility. And that's not truly equal, that's that's um, mostly equal, <laughs> kind of like the Princess Bride and, and mostly dead. But mostly equal means that if you want continued adoption, then you have to continue to maintain forward compatibility. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means, but first I want to talk about where that matters. We said that there are layers that represent a boundary, and these are do fun things, which stands for data, functions, and tests. And the big loud worker bees, which stand for boundaries, life cycles, and workers. Do fun things with big loud worker bees, data, functions, tests, boundaries, life cycles, workers. And these all feed into the API. So the rules are different for the boundary API than they are at the core layer. I want to talk a little bit about, so boundary is already becoming a bit of an API because that's a process boundary. It's named that for a reason. So I want to talk about the difference between how I treat code in the core and how I treat code on the boundary. So the strategies for dealing with various elements are different. Earlier in this series, I mentioned the idea that you want more code in the core and less code in the boundary. And the reason is that the strategies that I deal with are often more comfortable in the core than they are on the boundary. So for example, pipeland is a happy place, with land a little bit less so, and with is a code construct that allows composition with uncertainty. Pipes allow composition with certainty. And as you can, as you might expect, that's a more concise representation. It's a more concise API. So if we make sure that our data is clean and polished, in the core, and then, then we can basically compose with a lot of pipes. And that's gonna percolate through just about everything that we do, because when there are mistakes in the core, they're not things that we can typically deal with because we don't expect the failure. So we can just let it crash and let the rest of the Erlang ecosystem, the Elixir ecosystem, take care for of us. And that's not necessarily true on the boundary side. On the boundary, I might need to present something to the user. So instead of returning, of, of just returning simple values, I'm often returning data that encapsulates either success or exceptions, an OK tuple or an error tuple. And so these strategies get even more important when it's time to consider change. So if success is equal to compatibility, I'm going to make a certain number of decisions. So for example, from a data standpoint, on the core, I'm happy to use more restrictive types like structs. On the boundary, I want to use less restrictive types like maps to preserve compatibility so that I can update 
either the core or either either the client or the server for any any public API that I push to production. And so why might I, I make that choice? Well, I make that choice because if I want to preserve compatibility in either direction, you know, new client or new service, then in the core, I can change anything that I want to. It's not going to change my API, right? It's not gonna change my boundary. I can react in the boundary to changes in the core, but on the boundary, I can only allow new optional keys. The required keys have to be set and established at version 1.0 and at no point after that in order to maintain compatibility. And further, I'm nailing down the functions that I'm allowed to change. So if you look at things in the core, I can change my functions, I can delete, I can update them with impunity. In the boundary, that's not so. Once I create a function, I have to leave it alone. Only thing I can do is create new functions. So if you think about things in terms of create, read, update, and delete, those are the, that's the CRUD acronym. In the core, I can create, update, and delete functions with impunity. On the boundary, the only thing that I can do is to create new functions. So as you might have guessed, I don't believe that semantic versioning is typically a good idea. I think that we need to, we need to be stronger, that we need to only allow forward compatible changes moving forward. And so that means that if I have a whole new API, it should be in a whole new namespace. And um, if, I, if I adopt those rules, then my, re then my users will love me. Then the only way that my API can break is if I, have, if I make some logical mistakes or if I break something, if I change something that breaks the compiler, which is a great thing, which means that I can only have problems that I can detect at compile time, which is exactly what I'm after. So these are the, the things that we've talked about. These are the, the considerations for the APIs in that core set of services, and the boundary, uh, the core layer, the pure functions, and the boundary set of services. And when you're at the data line on down, those are included to preserve compatibility. When you're on the errors and the composition, those those things those things will improve the your quality of life as a programmer because they're easier concepts to teach, to code, to read and um, to understand for the future for the future programmers. So that's all I have for this particular lesson. I'm hoping that we have that we have some decent questions. But I want to thank a couple of people as always. First and foremost, my very good friend James Gray. Um, James, thanks for all the all the work that you've done in helping us understand Elixir and um, and the tremendous content that that you helped to produce um, with the designing elixir systems with otp when i asked you to um to consider writing a book like that i didn't expect to be writing it with you but i'm so glad that we got to and also thank you to jose jose has so many great ideas in in this uh, in this language and every time that i i talk about another topic i i run across excellent decisions that jose's made so thank you very much, my friend. You're a, um, a good language designer um, and a better person. So that's all I've got. This is Bruce Agroxia Learning. We have small classes, uh, starting a small OTP class. We have one more slot in our OTP course for two and a half days, starting May 27th. We have um, conference news coming, so you should watch Twitter specifically at gigacityelixir.com. Tomorrow, we're going to announce um, what we're doing with that conference, or I'm sorry, uh, Friday, we're going to announce what we're doing at that conference. 
and come join us at Groxio. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, the yearly subscription right now is the best deal. We're trying to drive those. Uh, mainly, um, they're mainly a better deal for you because they they end up being an all access pass. All the content that I create um, is available, um, you know, for a yearly subscription. And so right now we're doing OTP. It's on a, it's, it, we basically publish content on a regular basis. Right now we're doing OTP in July 15th. Um, I can confirm that we will be doing live views. So I would like to open up things for questions, not just for this topic, but for the entire series. Perfect. Thanks again, Bruce, for three fantastic webinars. Um, just while we wait for some questions to come in, uh, a reminder that, as always, we will be sending out a email with recordings to not just this webinar, but the last two as well. So the whole three series will be in your email next week. Um, in that email, we will also include links to the things that Bruce has discussed today in terms of the classes and Gig City Elixir. And we'll also include a link to our next webinar, which happens on June 3rd, which features Robert Verding, Francesco, uh, Mikhail Slavsky, and Bruce will be a guest on that webinar as well. Um, so if you have questions, please do get them in. The first one we have is, how do a Phoenix context and your boundary definition relate to one another? Okay, this is a starting us off strong. Um, that's a great question. And it basically, the, the main question is, how do I manage dependencies in a Phoenix project? And so the context in Phoenix is definitely a boundary layer. Um, it's a dependency. And in that, in that case, it's a, um, it's a relatively tightly coupled dependency. And that's very appropriate. So I am, when I'm coding Phoenix, um, especially with Live View, and I have um, a very close relationship between my um, my context and the application that I'm working with. I will very often build a um, a context layer, right? So, but you have additional options when you're building dependencies. One of those options, the next level of reduced coupling, is the umbrella. And so you might build an umbrella if you have um, if you have still related um, sub applications, if you will, because these are actually Erlang um, applications under the covers. They have an application file. You can build an umbrella application and um, and you can get some of the benefits of building um, of building and testing the whole system at once or one individual system as you might need to. And the next level of dependency on down is called the poncho dependency. And this is basically, if I started a Phoenix project with Mix Phoenix New, um, I'm, and maybe it was Mix Phoenix New um, game, right? So I could change into that game directory. And if I wanted to build a dependency, for example, for a high scoreboard that right now is only used within this project, um, but it might not always be, I might do another Mix Phoenix New of high scoreboard, right? And so, Different frameworks, like especially the NERVS framework, likes this strategy for delivering um, tools because the tooling is is really easy for deploying applications with close dependencies that way. And the other two different kinds of dependencies are um, are different mixed dependencies, or actually three. Um, you know, one of them is a path dependency, and, and basically a poncho um, dependency works sort of like that. Um, well, exactly like that, but it's it's one flavor of path dependency. There's also a Git dependency where you can point to a particular um, a particular Git project or even one commit within a Git project. And the last dependency type is um, is the loosest one, and that's a um, well probably alongside the uh, the Git dependency, probably a little bit tighter is a, um, a hex dependency, and that's the hex package manager, package manager that's used with Elixir and, um, and uh, Erlang Beam um, applications. So those are the dependency management strategies, but a context is definitely a boundary layer, right? And if you see, if you notice, 
if you build the scaffolding, especially for um, a Phoenix application, um, even if it's a live view application, you'll see that one of the things that's respected is that the context itself um, is, is allowed to have things like side effects. So these are not pure functions. These are boundary concerns. And, and you'll notice that a lot of the return codes coming out of the boundary have result tuples in them, right? Rather than having um, just, a, just a flat um, failure um, in the event in the event of failure, um, they they'll return like error tuples instead. So, so that's a that's a context. Perfect. Um, there is a question building on that, which is um, based on a similar sort of line of questioning. What about a Elm front end with an Elixir boundary? Does that work the same? An Elm front end with an Elixir boundary. So basically, everything in this talk that we've talked about um, would 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 come into play, right? So um, so all this is is a public API, um, but one that happens to span languages. So it becomes more important to stay away from, and this is actually a good illustration of why you would want to stay away from language specific types or structs and you would want to steer more towards um, different types of data that are common across languages like perhaps JSON or something like that. But but the overall concepts of reducing the surface area and um, and the way that we managed the individual APIs completely come into play with an with an Elm with an Elm front end. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of people implementing Elm front ends since the um, since we've created Phoenix Live View because Live View manages so many of those details so well, right? So it's almost like um, like Live View gives you a lot of what Elm would, um, you know, there's 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 a pretty there's a a pretty um, there's a shrinking um, a shrinking place in in a Venn diagram um, where where Elm makes sense, right? So there are still some some elements where um, so for example, if you had a lot of sophisticated drag and drop, um, that's not in um, you know, there isn't a super clean um, solution in Phoenix Live View yet, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of Elm work in that area, so it might make sense to do Elm. But that Venn diagram of places that I would I would consider using Elm um, because of the time that it can save me, even though it's um, I, I add the complexity of working across languages, that Venn diagram is shrinking. And I would say it's also shrinking with um, with the places that we we write custom JavaScript. And you know, that's just a testament to the work that um, that Chris and the rest of the Phoenix team have done. Perfect. Um, the next question is, how do you call the core functions from the API module directly to the module, or does the core have its own API? Okay, so um, that's a great question. So typically, when you're looking at layers, um, at distinct layers on a system, you try not to go, um, you try not to to skip, um, you try not to skip a layer, right? So typically, your API would call the boundary, and your boundary would call the the core layer. Um, and you might you might have some delegations, some some delegates that um, just passed information through, but you typically don't want to skip a layer, right? But the design pattern of places where you've designed in um, places to skip um, to skip an intermediate layer, that's the trapdoor pattern. So there are specific places where you want to do that. But typically, you try to you try not to skip a, a layer in your architecture. Um, the next question is: uh, Can you please reiterate on why boundary level? Um, why on the boundary level we want to use map, but for the core level struct, why not use struct everywhere we can? <laughs> so um, there are so this is definitely controversial advice. There are people in the Elixir communities 
um, that that say you should use structs everywhere, right? So I want to basically, uh, so I am talking from a from a definite school of thought. Um, I don't know, maybe Dave Thomas would be in this school of thought, um, maybe James. Um, James and I have talked about this a couple of times. Um, he's a little bit less strong, but, um, but still in the camp. But basically the idea is that you want to build services and clients that are completely independent of each other, that can be or that can be as independent of each other as possible, right? So you don't want to be in a situation where you have to upgrade the client and the server at exactly the same time. So you want to provide the flexibility where, um, where you could deploy either one of those first. And the way that that tends to work best is, is first, where you never, once you create a required key, it is always a required key. Second, it's any new key that you create is optional. And third, any key that you get that that you don't any any key that you receive that you don't understand you ignore. And so there's there's a set of rules that looks something like this. I don't I don't have time to go into all of them right now, but they basically allow you to update either the client then the server or the server and then the client. And you can't do that if you fix the set of keys exactly as um, as structs tend to do. Now I'm going to um, I'm going to follow this with a with a couple of examples where um, where I definitely know that you have to have um, that you have to have a struct in place um, within the Elixir community um, and APIs that I think are actually very well conceived and considered. Um, one of those is the plug API, right? So there's a um, there's a plug.con, and that is a struct. And the struct is um, is basically used throughout the um, the Phoenix architecture, um, even um, even in Phoenix plugs, right? But that's that's a case where we have a data structure that's that's pervasively used across the whole Elixir ecosystem, where we have to have um, where we have to agree on a contract, and um, so this whole controversial idea is um, is how much advantage do we take of the idea that we're a, a dynamic language and some people say you know we should try to um, we should try to type I know we're dynamic but we should try to type as much as we can and another school of thought says says that if we loosen the coupling in some key places, that so being a little bit more dynamic gives us um, gives us a lot of power and flexibility, especially when you're trying to upgrade very large systems. So that's the overall theory, and I understand if you don't um, if you don't agree with the with the with the premise. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, the next question is about data driven process, and uh, it is. Can you explain what data driven means again, and maybe by comparing it to what a uh, approach that is not data driven would look like? Okay, so um, I, I think probably the best way to understand um, understand an, uh, a um, a design approach. Now, I'm not trying to be very formal or to tie this to any any um, formal design school or um, you know uh, basically you know basically any, any kind of formal um, design school, what I'm saying is that very often new Elixir developers will start thinking about a design of an API with functions first. And I'm suggesting that if rather than, so say we're building a, um, a bank API. So if we think about the individual, um, the individual chunks of data that we'll need, you know, call them structs or call them maps, but um, but the bank accounts and the customers and things like that. Often, that's a, a better approach than thinking about the um, the verbs first, right? So um, a good example is that 
um, if I am building um, if I'm building an API like this, most APIs will land um, land in the area of request and response, eventually being my major two functions, and um, and the um, and the request and the request data that you're passing through will have um, will basically have descriptions of the functions that are um, that that you're passing through, and um, it's much more likely to land on that design um, if you start with the data first. Thanks for that. Uh, how big, in terms of lines of code, do you expect an API layer function to be? Okay, so um, here's another place where um, I am probably a little bit extreme. Um, I want my APIs and my handlers, my um, any of the the Gen Server um, handle callbacks, any of my Live View handle callbacks. I want those to be as skinny as I can possibly make them. Um, most of mine are just a couple of lines of code. Sometimes they creep into um, something a little bit longer. Um, and the uh, the examples in designing Elixir systems with OTP are pretty good examples of this. So um, my handle um, APIs um, might um, might creep into like five or six lines of code. In the very rare occasions, like I think that we had um, one handle that um, that wanted uh, that that needed a um, a function to uh, a persistence function um, to be passed in. I think that that kind of crept into like um, eight to ten lines of code or something like that, at least with the the core code. Um, but everything else is kind of smaller. And the APIs, since they tend to be um, really based on the boundary APIs, um, they can be really tiny. And in fact, Dave Thomas has a um, has a framework, uh, a couple of frameworks. He's um, he has in the past worked on a component framework, and and um, he also worked on a um, on a handler or on a um, on a Genserver API called Jeeves. And um, I like this idea quite a lot, uh, but he he actually has um, the the handle piece is really really skinny. Or, I'm sorry, the API piece is really really skinny, and much of the work is abstracted um, on the macro level um, out to a core. Cool. Uh, a couple more. Uh, what is your opinion on using def delegate on the API layers? Def delegate on the API layers. Um, I tend not to, um, but the reason is that um, is that I often work with relatively young developers, um, and it's just another concept to learn. Conceptually, I love the idea. Um, I think that it basically allows me to um, to maintain the shape of an API from one, one layer to another. And maybe the best thing to do is to um, is to kind of to to basically hammer on the theory of of what we're doing is to use more depth delegates. But it seems like um, a little bit of extra ceremony um, that is is a um, it's it's it slightly gets in the way of um, of teaching good elixir to um, to young people. Um, so it basically teaches a higher level concept at the expense of teaching the low level elixir concept. So for that reason, I tend not to. Um, that I know that reason is really really weak. Um, I probably should do more of it. Perfect. That is all uh, the questions that we've had. Um, thank you, Bruce, again, and everybody for joining us over the last three webinars. It has been such a fantastic series and so great to have you all here. Um, we look forward to Bruce seeing you again and talking to you again, both in June 3rd, and I'm sure we'll have something soon lined up for another one. Um, until then, everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bruce. You're quite welcome. Take care.